tomorrow's ordination is going to have two steps. It's what's called the going forth and then the acceptance. The going forth is a step of becoming a samanera. It's accomplished by taking refuge in the, Buddha, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. We say these things over and over again. It's good to think about what they mean. And of the three, the most important is the Dharma. Because after the, the Buddha is important because he discovered the Dharma and taught it. The Sangha is important because it helps keep the teachings alive. And somebody said, you take the Dharma as your refuge. You do that by practicing mindfulness, establishing the mindfulness in the right way. At the same time you do that, you're taking yourself as your refuge. Because as the Buddha explained, the reason we suffer is not because of things outside, things that other people are doing. It's because of things that we're doing, that we have to change. And change requires that we look very carefully at ourselves, because we're not suffering from generalities. I mean, the, the words of the teachings are expressed in general terms. The cause of suffering is craving. The suffering itself is clinging. You can know that, and you can still suffer. You have to know the details. Why do you crave? Why do you cling? So we have to get down to the specifics. Like with pain. There are many ways that we feel pain in the body, many ways that we feel pain in the mind. And we know that we suffer from aversion toward the pain. But you can't just tell yourself, well, don't have aversion. Years back, a woman who had an autistic son came into the monastery. He was becoming a teenager, and lust and anger were becoming real problems. Got angry at somebody, just hit them right away. And she told me, tell them not to be angry. I said, we can't tell somebody not to be angry. The first step is to say, when you get angry, this is what you do. In this case, I told him to breathe calmly. And the tension that was building up around the anger in his body, and just let it disperse. So he didn't feel so compelled to have to act on the anger. But that's just symptom management. Got to get down to the, the details. When you're angry, when you're feeling averse, say when you're feeling averse to pain. Exactly what are you doing that leads to that sense of aversion? How are you assembling your experience of pain? Because it is something we assemble. It's not that we simply make it up. I mean, if there's a pain in the body, there's a pain in the body. In some cases you find out that's because of the way you're breathing, sometimes it's because of the way you're perceiving things. Sometimes it's because of the way you're talking to yourself, what you're paying attention to, how you're paying attention, what your intentions are. Lots of different things that can go into a specific pain, and also why that pain makes inroads on your mind. Perception is a big issue. And you have to question your perceptions. And some of them go very deep, back to our pre-verbal days. Because after long before we were able to understand language, we had pain and we had to deal with it. And our ex pre verbal experience has shaped a lot of our attitudes toward the pain. When it seemed to be overwhelming, when you had no idea that it wasn't, wasn't going to last forever. When it seemed to be spreading around and you felt that you had to contain it. And 
A lot of those attitudes are still lurking around. So you feel that your body is the pain. The word, the, say, the pain is in your knee. It's right there, and it takes over your experience of the body. A lot of these attitudes are still buried there in the mind. And they can get provoked by different pains. So you've got to see the specifics. But right now is your perception of the pain. And the best way to do that is to ask specifically, do you feel that the body and the pain are the same thing? Then you remind yourself, well, they're not. Your experience of the body is of the four elements. Earth, water, wind, fire. The pain is something else. Now it seems to get glommed on, especially to the earth, the solidity of the body. But you can ask yourself, can you not glom it on? You're the one who's doing the glomming. Or when you have a perception of a pain being right there, and it is a pain. Or do you have the perception that it's got a bad intention toward you, that it's meaning to attack you? Is it, or is it coming at you? Can you perceive it as going away from you? It arises in moments and passes away in moments, and again and again and again. Can you see each moment going away, going away, so that you don't feel like you're the target of the pain? So you've got to look at the specifics of the perceptions. That requires that you calm down and have the right attitude that you're here to comprehend it. That, the Buddha said, is the duty of the First Noble Truth. Now for him he's talking about mental pain, but the mental pain, of course, that comes from physical pain is largely based on how you construct your experience of that physical pain, how you perceive it, what images you have in mind, what intentions you have toward it. You try to make sure that your intention is not so much to blot it out, but to not let it invade your mind or stay there. And that's a different intention entirely. Most of the time we want it to either go away, or we push it away, or we run away from it. But can you tell yourself, it, it is possible to be there, be with the pain, but not let it invade your mind. What does it mean to invade, <clears throat> invade your mind? That's going to take over your thoughts. It's going to become the target of your thinking. Can you look off to the side a little bit to see what's around the pain? in terms of those perceptions, in terms of the conversations you have about it. Because you think about pain, and it's classed as a kind of feeling. And when you look independent core rising, feeling appears in several places. There's the feeling that comes right after sensory contact, but there's also the feeling that's in the name factor of name and form. And there it hangs out with Intentions, attentions, perceptions, and feelings. And contact among these things in the mind. And it also appears in fabrication, where it's hanging out with the way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself, and again with perceptions. Which means that the factor that's actually making the pain invade the mind right now. It could be any of its friends in the different factors of dependent core rising. So there are lots of things you could look at. Like we do have this tendency to send messages from one moment to the next. Watch out, there's a pain here. Watch out, there's a pain here. Watch out, there's a pain here. And that gives more reality to the pain, makes it steadier and more solid than it really has to be. What happens if you don't send those messages? You know, you see part of the mind that says, well, no, if I don't send the message, I'll run into the pain and it might get worse.
but at least be willing to try, experiment. Because sometimes that's what's keeping the pain oppressive, is this repeated message you're sending to yourself. So you've got to get to the specifics. Because as I said, you're not suffering from generalities. You're suffering from specific pains, specific events in the mind, specific perceptions, specific thought constructs. And only when you see the specifics will the Buddha's more general terms and the cure actually work. Like one of the cures we're told is that if you see things as inconstant, stressful, not self, you let go. You can repeat that over and over and over again, you're still not letting go. It's because you're not seeing the specifics. When you see how you actually worsen the pain with a specific perception, then you can see, well, that perception is something that's inconstant. You don't have to con continue with that perception. It's stressful. Why do you hang on to it? When you start thinking in those terms, that's when those three perceptions really get helpful. So the problem is in the specifics. The solution is going to be in the specifics. It's only when we see the specifics that we can understand how the more general terms of the cure are actually helpful, where they apply, how to apply them. So you develop a sense of dispassion. You wouldn't want to think that you're passionate for the way you perceive pain. But we think about it. We've built up all of these perceptions and ways of talking to ourselves around pain. We're passionate for those things, because we feel somehow they keep the pain under control, keep us alert to what's going on. But maybe they're part of the problem. Can you learn how not to be passionate for those perceptions, those mental habits? As the Buddha said with regard to craving, it's important to see precisely where it's located. He raised the question one time, do you have any craving in things that you haven't seen yet? Notice the way he said that, in things you haven't seen yet. And your first response would be, yeah, there are a lot of things I haven't seen that I'd like to see. But as he would say, in that case the craving is not in the things you want, to, you want to see. The craving is in your thoughts about them, your anticipations about them, your perceptions. It's when you can see where your craving is located that you can do something about it. And it's the same with clinging, precisely where the clinging is located, where there is passion for that particular event in the mind. Then you can do something about it. And that's when the teachings work, because you've got them focused right at the right space, the right event, the right moment in the mind.